Hello, I'd like to and we are recording. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight and welcome to another one of APSA's interactive sessions for the 2023-2024 academic year. We are pleased to host tonight's session with current trainees and tonight's topic will be focusing on preparing for step one. To start off, I'd like to first have our wonderful panelists go around and introduce themselves. If you all could include your current institution, your year in training, and any research or specialty interests. Um, to be efficient, I'll call on you each by name, starting with Colin O'Hearn. Hello, my name is Colin O'Hearn. I am a uh, G2. I guess it's my fourth year in the, the program here at MSU. I'm in the Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm in the DO PhD program here. Um, and I'm in the biomedical engineering graduate program. Wonderful. Welcome, Colin. Um, Danielle, you next. Hi, I'm Danielle. I'm um, currently G1, so third year in the program at Stony Brook University. And I am currently in the microbioimmuno program. Um, I'm studying innate lymphocytes in cancer. Great. Welcome. And last but not least, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. So I'm Elizabeth Diaz, and I'm in my first year of grad school, so third year overall in the program at Washington University in St. Louis. And I'm studying immunology and NK cell um, biology and brain tumors. And in terms of my specialty interest right now, it's between neuro-oncology and neurosurgery. So hopefully I have time to figure that out. Oh boy, quite the specialties. Well, welcome and thank you for all for joining us. Um, we're extremely grateful that you all took the time out of your day to join our meeting. Um, and thank you for providing such um, valuable information to your fellow trainees. My name is Monica. I'm an M2 MD PhD student at the University of Miami. I will be your moderator for the evening. Um, and the chat box also helping us moderate tonight will be Anna and our volunteer live treating the, um, the event this evening will be Ming Pham. Me. Um, for those who do need to step away or are going to miss a piece of this, as a reminder, our session will be recorded and we will be posting this on our YouTube channel following the session. Um, as the moderator, I would like to remind you all to please submit your questions to the Q&A box. We do already have questions um, that we've received that were submitted during the registration process. Um, we will have a team of moderators behind the scenes collecting your questions live and ready to answer them. I think that's all the announcements I have. So thank you all for being here. And we're looking forward to a great discussion. Um, I'll go ahead and start with our first question. Um, so we had a few questions that focused on this, um, but essentially they all kind of wrapped around since step one has changed to pass fail. Um, how is it being weighted now that it is no longer a number grade? And how are you approaching step one now knowing that it's a pass fail test? Um, Danielle, let's start with you. Um, sure. So. I think it, moving to step one kind of like took some of the pressure off. So I think I treated it more like, like instead of a test that I was kind of preparing for from the start of med school, I guess it was more something that I would focus on my med school classes and do well in them. But then um, when the time came, I would just take like the six weeks dedicated to study for it, pass it, and then move on to the next stage of life. I like that, especially move on to the next stage of life because there's so much, so much to learn and so much going on. That's great during your med school years. So it can't all be about one test. Um, Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I think my journey was a little bit interesting because since uh, step one became pass fail, I think the curriculum at my institution really shifted the focus away from learning a lot about the foundations of microbes and uh, mechanisms and more into understanding kind of the clinical aspects of things. So I kind of feel like if I would have gone back in time and redid this, so it wouldn't have been as stressful as I would have paid more attention to still learning those concepts on my own time instead of like waiting until dedicated time. Um, just because it's, it is pass fail, but I think the threshold to pass is still relatively high. You still have to memorize and understand a lot of things that sometimes like with the new shoring curriculums that a lot of medical schools are shifting towards, like you, you might not get the chance to cover. So in order for you to truly be comprehensive in what you need to know about 
uh, all the things in step one to pass, I think it's, it's still a relatively high bar. So coming into medical school and knowing that you have to prepare outside of the resources that may be offered in your medical school classes, I think is something that I would advise to my like younger self or to anyone else that is thinking about step one. Um, I think that like changing that um, to pass fail did take a lot of the stress away, but I think um, a lot of the knowledge that we need to know is still important for our outcomes in clinical rotation. So I think that was something that or um, attendings like were not as uh, understanding about like, okay, we might not know exactly the same level of knowledge as like previous years because our curriculum changed, but also because like we're not as focused in memorizing a lot of these things. So I think that it takes some of the stress away, but I think the requirements is still do well in, in terms of like passing and still like trying to learn that material is, is still important. Yeah, and I will endorse that. I'm on my first week of rotations this week uh, in psych, and they still want us to know all the drugs, and those were not something um, I was taught during my first year. So I'm learning a lot of new drug names. Um, when you say the foundational sciences, is there anything in particular that you really wish you had prepared? I know you mentioned micro. Yeah, so I think that microbes was huge for step one, and it was only like a like touched on subject in my curriculum so it wasn't like such a highlight um but when I got to like dedicated time I realized that was going to be really important so uh, I would have started to learn a lot of those things earlier on and I used sketchy micro and sketchy farm for that and I think that was probably the most enjoyable out of like a lot, a lot of the resources that I used because I used Anki I used first aid, new world, but I think sketchy micro made my like day a little bit brighter in terms of like, I was kind of excited to watch these funny videos instead of just like doing new world questions all day. So I think that if I would have gone back, I would have started doing those things earlier on. Wonderful. I think that's really valuable advice. Um, Colin, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, everyone pretty much covered everything. I will say, um, yeah, since it went from pass fail to score test, my uh, uh, colleagues who are years ahead of me uh, told their like horror stories of how you know neurotic they were during studying and trying to get a score and all that sort of stuff. Um, so there's definitely been a lot less pressure, I guess, on us from I guess that standpoint, trying to get a score versus just passing. I will. Uh, back up the comment about you shouldn't like sleep on the exam though i think the first year that the test went from pass fail to or from a score to a pass fail i think the fail rate went up a little bit in our in our school so you know i you still shouldn't sleep on it so my biggest advice is just uh you know spend like a full day's work eight hours a day just studying maybe uh you know like it's a nine to five job or something and then as long as you're doing practice questions and then reviewing what you got wrong and reviewing those topics you should be okay if you do that for about a month or a month and a half two months outside of your test date so uh yeah yeah i think that's really great advice especially that don't don't sleep on it being pass fail because i I sometimes feel that too, of, of being excited it's pass fail, but you it's still a doozy of a test. Um, on that note, since you started talking about um, kind of how you structured your preclinical and then your um, dedicated time, I was curious if everyone could go through and just kind of break down first during their preclinical year. Um, and then when it came closer to the actual date during dedicated, what resources they used, um, anything in particular that really stood out, um, what was your routine like during all of these phases? Um, and Colin, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, when I was getting this advice from people in the year above me, uh, they told me not to worry about studying at all during preclinical and, you know, just do all your studying during dedicated, uh, kind of for the reason that it was pass, a pass-fail exam for them as well, uh, and they transitioned to that. So um, I was definitely very nervous, like, going into the year, like, are you sure I shouldn't prepare a little bit at all? Um, so... 
I ultimately didn't uh, study at all during preclinicals, and our school gave us about two months uh, of dedicated study time. And so doing that full time, like eight hours a day, like I said, um, was sufficient enough to get, you know, the pass, at least for me. I guess it just depends on you and how well you feel like you're doing on your practice questions. Um, and just to clarify, yeah. when you say didn't study at all, you mean you didn't study specifically step one resources? Yeah, specific. so we were still finishing up like our last few systems courses. So okay. like uh, so our last one. systems course was uh, respiratory. So okay. um, in respiratory, we went over a lot of the bugs that you'd see on boards and, um, you know, res respiratory is pretty well represented on uh, step one. Um, so uh, our school kind of structured it in a way where that was kind of the last material you'd see. And a lot of it was pretty relevant to board study. Um, but as far as like doing new world practice questions um, and stuff like that, I didn't do that until dedicated. Um, if you were to try to do anything preclinical, maybe some sketchy micro, I know that was brought up before uh, by Elizabeth, is definitely well represented on the exam. So um, if you if that is a weak point in your knowledge base, definitely ham hammer the microbiology. And then when it came to dedicated, you had, you said about two months, about eight weeks, and you focused uh, mostly on these U-World step questions, or did you mix in time going over material, or was it mostly uh, problem practice? Yeah, so what I did was I did like maybe two to three blocks of questions every morning, um, and then I would review those questions and try to get done reviewing those questions in the same day, uh, so that the next day, I would just focus on reviewing all those concepts I got wrong, either using the USMLE first aid or the uh, sketchy micro or, or any sketchy kind of video, whatever topic it was. Um, so as long as you're mixing in questions and then reviewing the concepts that you got wrong based on those questions, um, and it really allows you to identify where you're kind of weak in your knowledge base, and it allows you to focus more time on that, and I will say that U World practice tests were really representative of the kinds of questions you saw on the exam. So I felt like uh, anything I got wrong taking those questions um, was a good representation of you know the exam and what I needed to improve upon as far as concepts. Great, that's really good to hear, especially regarding U World kind of being the go-to resource. Um, Danielle, is there anything you'd like to add about how you structured your preclinical years going into dedicated time? Um, yeah, so I, I don't know how it is at other medical schools, but our medical school recently, um, so all of our exams were preclinicals for the most part were like board exams um, or MBME style board exams. I guess in that sense, I was kind of like, I guess I was kind of used to like, like kind of the same resources I used to study for my exams for every block were the same ones I ended up using for step one. So I used Boards and Beyond, um, Pathoma. I think I used Sketchy for the bugs and drugs. Mm, and then I did use Anki as well, especially to complement like the Sketchy videos. Um, that said, I don't think I, yeah, I don't think I like specifically um, started studying for like step one itself until my dedicated period. I think I Initially, I think I I tried to like kind of keep up with some of the Anki cards from prior blocks, but it just became too much. And I think it was better for me to just like focus on learning the new material for that block. So great. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um and Elizabeth, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, so I kind of learned how to study for medical school kind of late in my preclinical phase. So the only body system that I actually did study like for my classwork as well as study for step was for the neuro portion and I felt like that was extremely helpful because looking back that was the material that helped me like all of the um like sketchy micro sketchy farm and like boards and beyond like all those resources helped me do well in the exams for my curriculum but it also helped me kind of retain everything for when I was starting dedicated time. So I think that was like a, probably a good strategy that I wish I would have learned earlier. And when I started dedicated, I had to extend it two months because our school gave 
was eight um eight weeks but I at the end of that time period I still didn't feel comfortable taking it so I extended two more months and I think when I hit like um plateau of where my score was like consistently for you world like 60 to 70 percent in my practice test that's when I decided to take it and like I kind of felt burnt out at that time too so I was like okay like <laughs> whatever happens happens so um I think yeah my uh advice would be to try to incorporate more of that step studying earlier on like I think it helps you to also like understand whatever your curriculum is teaching you because our curriculum is not at all matching like what's tested on steps so it was I think um difficult for me to understand how important that was in the beginning um but after a couple of modules like I, I figured that out that was like going to be helpful Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's a great point to touch on as well of, of some schools curriculums are uh, switching to a more NVMe focused um, style of questioning. I know our, our school is, but that's not the case for everyone. So if you are, um, I think it's good to know at your institution, what the exams look like relative to the final NVMe test that you do end up taking and, and know where the overlap is. Um, on the subject, because I know you guys kind of all uh, mentioned Anki. So raise your hand if you used Anki at all. Um, and one thing I'm curious about, because I'm I am knee deep in the on king deck right now, but I've heard from a lot of folks that it is way overkill, that you don't need to do um, all the cards. And then I have colleagues that they're doing 200 a day because they did the math to try and make it through all of them in time. Um, so if anyone would like to just jump in and just tell me whether they thought Anki was useful, how they used it, whether they actually made it through the whole deck, um, specifically the on king step one deck. Um, I I didn't really treat it as a deck where I had to like get through all the cards. I used it more like a kind of like a searchable database where like as I learn things in class, I just search up like that term and like unsus unsuspend the relevant cards. Um, so in that sense, I guess I like it saved me time because so I, I didn't have to make the cards myself. Um, yeah, I don't. I yeah, I would say that I, I didn't necessarily get through all the cards. It was more just for like stuff that was pertinent to what I was trying to learn at the moment. Elizabeth, you raised your hand as well. Were you using Anki a lot? So I did use it towards the end. So I used it for the neuro portion because I felt like that was when I like realized how to study and what worked for me. I didn't enjoy Anki and I don't think it was helpful necessarily for step one studying. I felt like the most helpful resource for step studying during dedicated was UWorld because UWorld, some of the things were that were um, asked on UWorld, like I didn't know the concept, but then it also gives you pretty comprehensive explanations on like why you get something wrong or like why other people get it wrong and like some of the um the way I was using UWorld was not sorely just to like see how much I knew, but also to learn more. So I, I ended up getting through all of you world uh, question bank, but for Anki, I, I only did it for a little bit, but it, it just was painful and that's not how I learned best. So I, I dropped it. Um, but I know that most people in my class um, use that and they like swear by it. So I think if, if, if it works for you and if you're okay with it, like I think it's a good resource. Um, can I add something? I, um, so I, um, I guess, so one thing that I found Anki useful for was when I was going through like the UWorld questions when I was actually preparing for um step one. So for the questions I I got wrong, I would also go through like the all the different answer choices, and sometimes you know some of the sometimes the knowledge is it's not that it's more just like you didn't, it's more just like content based material that you didn't learn set, so like based on the different answer choices, I would like search up those terms and unsuspend like cards related to that concept. And in that sense, I guess it helped me like make sure I learned everything that I would need to know to be able to answer that question correctly in the future. Okay, thank you for adding that. I really like that strategy because um, I know Anki can definitely be polarizing um, as far as a resource goes. I think I personally, I struggle to learn 
through Anki because it's just like facts hitting you over and over. Um, but I only recently discovered that you can click the first aid button and it does actually within the Anki decks um, does show you a little more. So you can start if there's something that you don't necessarily understand too well, you can read through all the first aid about it as opposed to just getting hit with fact, fact, fact over and over. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's uh, I, I think Anki is certainly a polarizing resource. So it's good to hear that. I think the way you both used it, that it was used, but that you world and doing questions um, sounds like it's a much more worthwhile use of your time. Um, I wanted to touch on as well, since we were talking a little bit about, um, about dedicated time, I was curious um, how many weeks you had in total. And then um, I, I'm hearing horror stories of students studying seven days a week for the entire two months. Um, how did you structure your day and how did you still try to find balance? Um, Colin, let's start with you. Yeah, so dedicated for us, um, I think was two months roughly uh, for me. I think people had the option to go two and a half months if they wanted, but I wanted to enjoy my extended summer break. So I uh, did the thing a little earlier. Um, so as far as how I initially started, so, you know, when you're starting out, you kind of don't really know where to start. You're like, all right, I just know I have to get all this information in my head and you know, do as best I can on this exam. So you really just got to jump right in, get your feet wet and start doing practice questions. Um, so I try to do a little bit of practice questions every day. Um, when, when I say every day, kind of Monday through Friday, you know, Saturday or Sunday, I think I did a little bit of review uh, maybe each day. Maybe Sunday went a little soft, um, but I made sure to get a little bit in, just a little bit every day. Um, but save the bulk of like the long days for Monday through Friday. Um, yeah, because you'll be surprised how much you forget if you, you know, take more than a few days off of, you know, just studying and you forget stuff. So, um, so at the beginning, I think I went a little light. I did study Monday through Friday, uh, two to three blocks of questions in the morning, review them, and then review the concepts using a uh, sketchy or Pathoma, or uh, what was the other one, first aid. Um, and then if, uh, as maybe like a month approached, I started to try to do practice questions, more of them in a day. Uh, so I'd probably try to do more blocks of questions in a day and try to review them, those blocks by the end. And then I think two weeks out, that's when I started doing this like uh, cycling with like doing eight blocks of questions in a day. The next day, just review those questions and then alternate that until the exam came around. Um, I think the day before the exam, I just uh, took a break or took a day off, uh, but just to get my mind right and ready. Um, so that's how I did it. It worked for me. Um, but yeah, the, I, I kind of did that similarly for the MCAT. So that's just the way I like to study. So I think other people it just depends on maybe uh, your preferences and what you mm -hmm. want to need and for yourself. Mm -hmm. it sounds like you had like a get or done approach. You just wanted, you wanted to to get it done as quick as you possibly could um, and approach it mm -hmm. you know, fully. Uh, yeah. Elizabeth, anything you'd like to add to how you approached your dedicated? Yeah, so my beginning of dedicated time, uh, I was supposed to take my exam in eight weeks, but it ended up being 16 weeks. Um, because um, I think that the beginning of step one, there was a lot of things going on personally that kind of hindered me to be able to focus on step one studying. And I um, had like so much stress that I thought I was learning, but I think that when I got closer, like a month before my exam date, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to take it comfortably. Like, I, I guess I was never really feeling like I was 100% prepared, but like the scores were also reflective of me not being prepared at that time point. So then I had to kind of get in touch with my medical school deans and get advice on like, what did I need to change to, you know, to progress. So like one of the first things that I think was really important that I never had really thought was important before was um, getting help from like a therapist to get like anti-anxiety medication so that was like the thing that kind of helped me structure like my dedicated time better because after I, I figured that was like an issue and that was hindering me able to like 
retain information and to feel like I could like I could get through this time point so that was kind of the first thing that was super important um and then like the second thing was getting help from like a educational uh specialist who kind of like advised me on how to structure my week so I ended up I started off with like 15 hours of studying and I I, I was just miserable completely miserable so I changed that to eight hours. So I made it more of like a eight hour work day. And then I would only do that Monday to Friday. Um, and then I also incorporated like wellness into my day. Cause I think that it was like a very isolating time point where I was like always in the basement of my library doing U World and like watching videos. So uh, kind of like what I look forward to at the end of my day was like going to the gym so I think that was important in helping me stay sane during that time point. Um, so I think that that those are like the main things that um, helped me. Thank you for sharing that. I, I really love that you touched on wellness too, because I think it can be such an isolating time. And we as students solely focus on like the topics we need to learn and we're discussing that. Um, but being able to be in the right mindset when you approach this test is really important. Um, just a follow up to that, I, you mentioned that you relied on your school's resources. Did you find that the school, your school was supportive um, and helping you uh, get to the point where you could take step one? Did you feel comfortable working with them? Yeah, so I reached out to them at the end of that first month of dedicated when I realized like everything was in fire, like things weren't going well with my studying. So I reached out to them. Uh, so they have so many resources that they don't advertise or like I, I wasn't aware of until I talked to the deans and they helped me get like more practice exams through um, like their financial assistance. So they helped with a lot of like resources that um, I think made it possible for me to be able to pass. So um, I know that sometimes they also offer like private tutors for people that just need like someone to help them be accountable. So they have so many resources and I think that um, I would reach out to them even before you start like dedicated because they have like advice and resources of how to like help you understand your, your learning way, like your best learning method. Um, so yeah, they have a lot of resources. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, Cause I, like I personally remember getting like one seminar at the very start of M1 year, summarizing all the resources um, a school had, um, and then kind of taking that out of my mind. So it's good to know that that is all still available um, and that your school wants you to succeed. Danielle, do you have anything you'd like to add about how you structured your dedicated time? I'm um, sure. I, I really like what Elizabeth said about the wellness. I think that's like one of the most important parts of the step one dedicated period. Um, I think for me, so for me, I I had planned a vacation like like a week after step one. And I think that kind of like motivated me to kind of keep on track. And um, I don't know, I just had that to look forward to. And then also I would, I like didn't completely isolate myself. I made sure that I would occasionally like get brunch with friends or just like meet up with um, my classmates who are off doing clinicals. Um, so it's kind of, so just to like kind of maintain that connection to the outside world and not to be like completely closed off. Um, I feel like the other, another thing is just to keep a consistent schedule every day, like waking up at the same time, sleeping at the same time. If you have like a hard stop time for when you want to stop studying, I think that helps you kind of motivate yourself to get through what you like set out to accomplish that day. Um, and yeah, obviously like taking taking time off and if like stuff wasn't clicking I would just take the evening off um yeah thank you for sharing you guys are so inspiring I am certainly guilty of like falling asleep in bed doing Aki cards way too much lately so I'm gonna try and try and make that not as much of a thing um on the subject of like this this dedicated time that you have for your school and that, that you can kind of structure when you take the test within this time, um, how did you know when you were confident enough to take the test? Um, so I know Elizabeth, you mentioned that you pushed it off and and 
Um, Colin, you mentioned you were taking some practice tests ahead of time. Um, so I'm just curious how all of you knew like, okay, this is it. Like I cannot learn any more than I need to learn right now. Um, Colin, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, for me, I felt good about, so our school, even though it's an osteopathic medical school, I did have to take the step one for DOs. And our school offered like a kind of a half step one exam for the DO exam. And the exams are pretty similar. So um, uh, they offer that, I think, a month or halfway through our dedicated time. Hmm. And I That's performed actually, uh... above. Oh, sorry. I was just uh, not to interrupt, but I just wanted to, uh, for the students that aren't quite aware, can you like kind of distinguish, do all DO programs, do they all take step one or is it something that's recommended? Oh. No, for if you're a dual degree student, like a DO PhD, they recommend we take USMLE or if you think you're going to go into like a surgical specialty or something, then they recommend we take it. Um, but by no means do you have to, like if you're going to go into family med or emergency med or something like that, then you can just take the uh, the complex exam. So yeah, for, so if any DOs are in the audience, DO PhDs, I probably know you since our community is kind of small, but uh, just reach out to me and I'll give you some insights on that. Um, but yeah, our school offered that kind of half step exam uh, halfway to our, during our dedicated and I achieved the score that they said they all wanted us to achieve, which is like, if you achieve a certain score, then you have a 99% chance of passing the exam when you take the exam in a month or something. So that that kind of validated kind of what my study plan was. Uh, and so that made me feel pretty good. Uh, I did have a friend who's also a DO PhD who didn't do well on that. And um, she had to, she took it again. She still didn't do well on it, but then she took her boards eventually and then passed it. So um maybe it's just a hard exam I don't know or I, I don't know some people the exam wasn't really representative of the actual exam when it came around so I don't I don't know what to make of it but um so that made me feel good and then the um I took the USMLE 3120 and I think that I don't know if that's I hope that's still a thing I, it was from the spring so I guess so but it's free 120 questions from the test makers of uh the USMLE step one and um, I got the, I guess the above a whatever, like a 70% on each section or something. And that made me feel good. And that was like a week out from the exam. And so that made me feel good about, you know, taking the exam. So, um, and I know that 70% threshold was something the College of Human Medicine here, because we both, we have an MD school here and a DO school here. The MD school said to their students, you should get 70% on each of these sections and they'll feel good about you passing. So um, so that kind of validate, validated my progress as well. So I recommend doing that if you can take that free 120 for the USMLE. At some point where you feel comfortable, I guess, maybe backing out of the exam or maybe not backing out of the exam, uh, uh, you know, sometime here beforehand. And I'd recommend taking that and see how you do on it. Um, but yeah, but also the UWorld questions, they give you like a percentage of, you know, how you do on each section. And I think they say if you're shooting, if you're getting like 55% and above consistently on each section, then you're probably going to pass the exam. So um, yeah. And I was hitting all those benchmarks. So if you're hitting those benchmarks before your exam, I think you should do good about yourself. Great. Thank you for all that information. Um, and can you just clarify as well, because I know um, you sign up to take the test within like a certain window and then you just have to complete it within that window, if that's correct? That is correct. I Yeah, so you, yeah, it's weird. I don't know why they do it this way. You gotta sign up for a test within a certain two month time period, I think it's long, or it's a month and a half, I don't know. And then you just schedule your exam what during that time period, I, I don't know if, it, I think it's a logistical thing between the test maker and then the the people who like, um, you know, actually have host the test for you. Um, I guess it's like a logistical thing because maybe some of these locations have different days they offer the exam depending on what test center you take it at. So um, yeah, so just pick that time period on the MBM, MBME website and then uh, Pearson or whoever, I forget who the test maker is or the test uh, 
Proctor is, um, will have specific dates depending on what location you want to take it at. And then I imagine too, if you have to push it back outside that window, you're probably paying on top of that to push it back. Uh, if I had to guess, I should ask my friend who did that, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I was curious just on the subject of locations, since I know we had this issue with the MCAT a while back where there were not enough locations available. I had a friend who like had to get a hotel room on the other side of the state in order to take her test. Have you guys found um, with step one that like the locations you wanted and the times you wanted were available? Yeah, they were available. Yeah, so we're in Lansing. I think there's only like one or two test centers here, maybe one. Otherwise, we got to drive an hour to Ann Arbor or Grand Rapids or Detroit or something. Um, but yeah, there are plenty of dates available. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. Good to hear. <laughs> um, Danielle, can you, I'm sure as well, just when you felt felt confident that you were ready to go and you were ready to take the test? Um, okay, to be honest, I think I like, because it was, because in the beginning, I was a little bit relaxed about it, that it made for a very like stressful, like two weeks right before the exam where I was like convinced I was gonna fail it and then um I think like even like after I took it I was convinced I failed it um but I think so I was taking like the practice exams and I agree the free 120 is a really good resource to take um and I think yeah I think I think basically if you're hitting like 55 and 60 they say that you have a pretty good chance of passing even if it doesn't like feel that way like just because like you're like missing half the question so you feel like you don't know anything but yeah they say that if you're hitting those benchmarks you should be good no i we've taken a few practice tests at our school and i've been feeling the same way you never feel good coming out of those um i've, I've heard a lot of friends say the same that you just you never feel good um elizabeth anything you'd like to add about how when you like knew you were confident you were ready to take the test yeah so i felt confident when I had hit that well I wasn't confident but I was kind of ready to take it when I was hitting that plateau at U, um, U World questions where I would do like all of the mixed organ systems and I was getting like the same score over and over again like 60 to 70 percent correct and I still needed more validation so I also took all of the CBSSE and BME practice exams and like the last two that I took, um, they predicted that I was gonna pass. So I was like, okay, like there's two metrics here that are saying that I'm gonna pass. So then I took it. Um, yeah, I think that was like when I felt ready to take it. Um, on the subject, because I know we've we've thrown around some resources, I just wanted to highlight um, kind of the resources that have been discussed so far. So we mentioned U World. Um, pretty significantly. So that's going to be, there's practice tests with the new world and there's a lot of example questions. You all mentioned the USMLE free 120, which is going to give you a free 120 questions. Um, there's the NBME practice assessments as well. Um, and then we've talked a lot about different study resources. So you've mentioned first aid. Um, I know for our school, we get first aid included, like an online version. There's also a big book you can buy. Um, I really like first aid because it's very, very concise. It's just like these tables of exactly the things you need to know and nothing more. Um, Boards and Beyond is another great resource that I use a bit. I know my roommate uses it a lot. Um, that does go over um, its videos in different content areas. And they're usually like 20 to 30 minutes long, um, but they're very concise as well and really only cover just what you need to know. Um, we've mentioned Sketchy and, and Pixarize is another one. We've mentioned those two quite a bit. Um, and those, well, I don't know, can anyone, can anyone describe sketchy? Um, it's kind of like these, these cartoons of, of, uh, I'm doing all the psych ones right now. And there's a funny office sketch I just watched last night. That's like, um, all of the, all of the drugs are different cartoons in the office sort of thing. Um, so sketchy is kind of just a way to help you remember, um, especially things that I feel like are really hard to remember just drug names and the like. Um, you just and mentioned then, the uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, you just mentioned the SSRI SN, SNRI. Got it. <laughs> you got it. The uh, the psych ones that are all of the uh, Dali and different art ones. Very creative. I thought that was very smart on their part. Um, so I think I'm I'm actually I was a late sketchy convert, and I'm actually really starting to enjoy that. They're pretty funny, um, and especially for things like 
um, drug names and all these bugs that you have to remember whether they're, uh, I don't know, urease positive and all of that. It kind of gives you this like visual of how you learn things um, that I've, I found really helpful. Um, Pathome is a resource I haven't used much, but I know there's a video series um, and a book as well, and that these are really great, especially for pathology. Um, and then lastly, we mentioned Anki quite a bit. Um, Anki has, there's this huge um, Anking deck that has all of the material seen in step one and step two. These are, you're probably all familiar, but they're these spaced repetition flashcards. And depending on how you rate um, your knowledge and understanding of a topic, it'll give it to you sooner or it'll give it to you farther down the road. Um, but Anki is much more geared, I would say, towards like little tidbits and facts um, and not as much towards like an overall understanding of like a clinical picture for how to treat someone. Um, we had a question as well that I can't answer, so I'm hoping one of you all can. That's about um, summarizing the structure of the step one exam, um, how many blocks there are, um, the duration within it, and the number of questions within each block. Um, I'll leave the floor open to whoever wants it. Uh, I guess since I took both exams, the DO one and the uh, USMLE one, I will say the USMLE one is, or step one, is a lot friendlier. Um, so I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you get eight total blocks, and then you get an, or no, seven total blocks, and then you get an hour of break time that you can choose to use whenever during the exam, uh, but they have to be between your blocks. Um, so yeah, my strategy was just like, take two blocks, take a 10 minute break, maybe caffeinate myself with my fancy mellow yellow, um, Gatorade concoction, maybe a banana, and then, um, take my second round of two blocks. So then, then I would take lunch, lunch, I'd probably do like 30 minutes of lunch, uh, pack a good lunch, good, healthy lunch, um, and then, um, yeah, resume with two blocks. And then I think I just ended up uh, doing two blocks, took my 10-minute break anyway, and then did the last block, even though it was just one last block. So I didn't even use all my break time. So it's I would just structure it based on how you practice your blocks when you're doing kind of practice questions and you're doing kind of those, maybe those simulated full-day exams. So, um, but I know some people who didn't use, like, many of their break time, much of their break time at all so it just depends on what you want to do but yeah yeah um and can you clarify as well how long is the total day um sounds like quite a day you get i think it starts at 9 a.m and then you get out around 4 30 ish it depends how much break time you use but it's kind of like a nine to five kind of day mm -hmm. Um, Danielle and Elizabeth, anything you'd like to add about how you structure the actual day? Yeah, so I kind of planned my meal because I have um, like a sensitive stomach. So I was like the day, even like the couple of days before I was like preparing everything so that I would be comfortable for that day. And uh, I took it at a center where they gave us a lunch period if we wanted to take it so I took it and we could go outside so I went outside um, and then I came back uh, and finished the rest of the exam so I think that I struck I structured the day I had practiced like the structure of that day previously with all my practice exams so I uh, scheduled my exam date on a Saturday and I had done all my practice exams on Saturday so that kind of helped me feel like it was a routine and it reduced a little bit of the anxiety and stress. So it felt like it's just another day that of studying, but instead of like doing UWorld, I was, you know, doing the actual exam. Uh, and I honestly feel like UWorld questions were harder, um, but I'm glad I feel that way because like if I hadn't used UWorld, I probably wouldn't have uh, been as prepared for, for like some of the way the questions were worded. Cause sometimes, the way that the questions are worded can be very time consuming for you to read the entire passage. So kind of like knowing that ahead of time and using like test taking strategies uh, helped me make sure I got through all of the sections on time and made me feel comfortable with all of my answers. Um, I also like try to do the 
the easier questions first, like all of the things that I had memorized off the top of my head, then I could go back and, and answer the ones that um, maybe were a little bit harder. Um, because I didn't know this at the time, but I found out later that some of the questions that are actually on step one, like aren't graded or like aren't used for, for, for like determining if you pass or not. So like some of those passages, looking back, I was like, oh my God, I'm, I don't even know what they're talking about. But like, maybe that was one of the passages that if I had spent like a lot of time, it would have detracted from the questions that were actually being um, scored or like um, assessed. Now, I think that's a really great point, especially doing the ones that you know is going to give you the confidence to start off to then carry you through the rest of the test, right? Um, you mentioned as well, like kind of some test taking strategies. Is there anything in particular that really worked for you? I know I've, I've seen some people really like to read um, the actual prompt at the end before reading the whole blurb, um, just so you kind of already have in your mind what um, what is being asked of you. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know about anyone else in the panel, but I just, I once you get the next question, I'm just like going through the next question from the top. Um, maybe if you're crunching on time, I would cheat a little bit and just like look at the answer choices, see what kind of question I'm getting. If it's like a foreign question or a, or a micro question, then maybe you can pick up a few keywords in the passage and just make a rushed guess if you're running low on time in the end. Um, but I would definitely try to read as much as the past, like the entire passage, if you can, um, as it's presented. But some people, I do know some people do that as well, that strategy as well. So it just depends what you like to do while you're doing your practice questions. No, that's a great point. And I think especially you guys all touched on kind of the importance of um, practicing and then um, you practice how you'll play at the end of the day. So having it at the same day and at the same time. Um, so that everything when it comes to test day looks exactly the same, I think is important. Um, Danielle, anything you'd like to add about how you structured when it came to actually taking the test on test day um, and how you scheduled your breaks? Um, so I think I actually like took a break between every section um, and you do get an hour total, but it doesn't feel too long. I feel like it's enough time for me to get up, drink water, use the restroom, come back, take it again, and then for the lunch break, yeah, you are allowed to go outside and leave the building. So I think I like went on a short walk, just like around the building, and then came back and go go touch it, some grass for a bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it. I think I was the only one in my testing center that was taking step one. So I think people were there for like other, I don't know, like CFA or whatever other exams. So a lot of them were like finishing and leaving and checking out, and I had like not started my lunch break yet. So. <laughs> I was like the last one at the test center. So it is a really long day. Um, so yeah, I would suggest to practice like that endurance beforehand. Um, and just like pack a good snack, pack water. <laughs> um, we also, I just want to make sure we have time to touch on because we got a great question in the chat. Um, that was about, because um, we touched on this a little bit before, but especially content that you didn't feel you learned adequately during your preclinical pre years. Um, I know we've mentioned kind of the bugs and drugs. Um, anatomy and embryology is one that I, our school does not touch on hardly at all at this point. And I, I've heard from students years above that it isn't really represented well on step one at this point, but I'm curious all of your thoughts. Yeah, I guess it depends on your school. Um, our school is pretty light on all the like genetic metabolic diseases so like the glycogen storage diseases and the I, I already forget the other diseases the lipopolysaccharide storage disease or I don't I don't know what I already forget what they're called um whatever gal Gauche's disease and all the Neiman the disease, ones. PASAC, yeah those the, yeah. um so those were really troublesome for me to memorize all their details so I really relied on the sketchy on that um um yeah those were represented and they weren't represented as much as I thought they would have been so I don't I don't know but yeah our school did a whole like uh reproduction female reproduction kind of uh unit um that wasn't really represented really well on the exam um there's certain like anatomy like concepts that are heavily tested on but 
by no means do you have to memorize the name of this outlandish forearm muscle, you know, or anything like that. Um, it's not like that specific. Um, and it's usually like medically related, whatever the anatomy question is. Um, uh, yeah, those are things on the top of my head. You guys have anything else? Um, yep. Danielle or Elizabeth, I don't know if you have anything to, especially to add about um, the question about anatomy or embryology topics and whether you saw those well represented. It seems to me a lot of this is you have to identify, um, you might not know your weak points until you start taking U world and you'll kind of see from there. And then that's where you might have to, um, it sounds like you might get surprised with the bugs and drugs and have a lot you have to learn from there. Yeah, so our school doesn't really focus on anatomy anymore. Like it's not as represented in our curriculum, but um, the way I like approached learning that material was that I used Yorld and kind of like you, you get to see a pattern of like the anatomical questions that are important, like related to certain diseases. So honestly, the only resource I used to kind of like learn anatomy or uh, understand it was Yorld. Um, yeah, so embryology, I kind of just uh, didn't have time to really study it. So uh, to be completely honest, I didn't um, feel like it was high yield for me, like high yield in terms of like, I didn't feel like it was as important to focus on that. So I focused on like the high yield subjects that um, I had heard from other students were going to be heavily tested. So like microbes, cardio, uh, respiratory, um, and neural. And that actually ended up being the case for the exam that I took, uh, which was like heavy on neuro. And I was glad because that's one of the subjects I like. So um, maybe I got lucky, but I think I started strategizing of like, yeah, I might not have entire like, you know, year to catch up on all the things that I needed to know, but I focused on the ones that were going to be high yield. Danielle, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, I agree. So like anatomy and rheology like really weren't my thing. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I guess lucky for me, it, it's not that high yield on the exam. So I think for me, I did the same thing as Elizabeth. I think I like focused on the more high yield sections first. Um, and then I think like towards the end, I did go just go through an anatomy like question bank and just kind of figure out like what key concepts kept showing up and made sure to look learn those and then call it a day so what i'm catching from you all is yes micro make sure to go over that um make sure to go over cardio and respiratory and don't worry too much about anatomy at the end of the day um and any anatomy will be relevant to like the the sort of pathology yeah now that we're talking more i really don't remember that many embryology questions maybe honestly the <laughs> extent to embryology you need to know is maybe just like what tissues derive from the three uh, germ layers and maybe that's kind of it because I don't remember anything about the I don't know the notch cord and the plate the medi medial plate or whatever we call it or, you know I already forget all their names so I feel like um, the answer is always neural crest cells so I always just answer neural crest cells. yeah neural crest yeah yeah okay, got it um for anyone that is really curious on anatomy or maybe is more interested in surgery um the netters uh, anatomy flashcards um they have them on on Anki um, are really useful. They're like, I would say way, seemingly way overkill for what we need to know if you're not interested. Um, but if you are interested, it, it has all of like this nerve innervates this muscle and, and really goes into detail on all of that. Um, we are closing up on our time and Anna um, put some really great resources in the chat as well. Um, just kind of a summary of everything we've gone over today um, and what's been helpful, but I just want to go rapid fire before we close today. Um, what is one thing you wish you had done differently, either, you know, some point in the study process? Danielle, let's start with you. Um, I guess, I guess for me, the main thing was that towards the end, I felt like maybe I should have done more in the beginning. I think maybe even, even like the fact that it's pass fail, like don't kind of brush it off in the beginning. Um, it will make your life a little less stressful from the test day approaches. Colin, anything you really wish you'd done differently? Um, 
I don't know. Maybe, I mean, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, maybe I could have started a little later. Maybe I could have, you know, not been as stressed for as long of a period of time. But I think it just depends on, you know, maybe if I failed, I feel differently, but I passed. So I don't know. I think I did okay. If I wanted to change anything, I'd actually, if there's anybody in the audience, uh, use some of the step materials while you're in med school right now. I felt like a lot of those resources were really good um, and really would have helped me if I actually used those and opened first aid during my first two years of clinical coursework. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, I think that's a really great point because I tend to be the type that I just do exactly what the school gives me um, and like really trust them. But um, I've had to find a balance of like sometimes you need to put your blinders on and not always trust, um, you know, your peers might be doing a lot that you don't necessarily need to do. But at times you can rely on your peers and see whatever else, um, what resources they're using. So I agree. I found like a lot of um, I'm using outside resources a little more than I expected. Elizabeth, anything lastly to close out that you really wish you had done differently during the study process? Yeah, I would have definitely started earlier and I would have incorporated studying for step at the same time as studying for the material. Um, I ended up um, learning that like I didn't have to go to lecture. So I think I would have saved time if I had to just watch like the recorded lectures instead of going to class um, and kind of focusing a little bit more on like step studying. Wonderful. And with that, I will close it all out because we're coming up on the time. Um, but I really want to thank you all for joining our Q&A session today. Um, especially want to thank our panelists, our wonderful panelists for their time tonight, um, all of the participants, you all um, who made the session interactive. Um, and then lastly, all the people, including um, APSA, the Virtual Content Committee and Partnership Committee, and then APSA Leadership. Um, our next interactive session, just to plug it, will be scheduled for October 26th. We'll have a panel of current students who will be answering questions about gap years and post back programs. Um, so again, one more thank you to our panelists and thank you to our attendees for all your great questions. Stay tuned for our upcoming webinars, the cycle, and good luck wherever you are in your journey. Thanks, guys.